Okay, hi everyone, uh, and welcome to this month's MAP webinar. Um, the topic of today's webinar is uh, the evaluation of CMIP-5 experiments. Um, just for those who may not know, this uh, CMIP stands for the Coupled Model Intercomparison Project. Um, it's a major international effort that involves coordinated experiments intended to test state-of-the-art climate and earth system models. Uh, the resulting data, as, can I please ask that everybody on the line use their phones? Thanks. Um, the resulting data is ultimately used as the, the backbone of, uh, of discussions of uh, future projections of climate in the IPCC report. Um, and this is a significant effort. It involves a lot of work on, on the part of the model. So in the United States, NOAA, NASA, and NCAR um, have all produced and submitted data for the experiment. And uh, at NOAA, two laboratories are involved, uh, GFDL, the, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, and also the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. Um, at current count, I looked earlier today, there are 22 international modeling centers that have contributed data to the archive, um, encompassing a total of 46 different models. So this is a huge effort. Uh, there's about three petabytes of data that's expected in the archive, which is 10 times the amount of data that was submitted in the last iteration of CMIT. And right now, the investigators and scientists are working furiously to prepare papers for submission by the July deadline. Um, the deadline is um, for the IPCC report. Uh, for results to be included, papers have to be um, submitted to journals by July. So we have uh, five speakers today, and they're going to touch on a variety of topics related to CMIP, um, including hydroclimate, temperature, and uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. The first speaker is Justin Sheffield from Princeton University, and um, in addition to his science talk, he's also going to discuss his involvement with uh, a new MAP task force um, on the topic of CMIP, which he's a, a co-lead of. And that'll be followed by Yolan Sarah from the University of Arizona, Jin Yi Yu from UC Irvine, Dave Nealon from UCLA, and Tao Zhang from NOAA Ezreal. So Justin, are you on the line? I am, yes. Okay, great. So I'm going to try switching control over to you right now. And just click that Share My Desktop button. You see it on the okay. There we go. Got it. Great. Yeah, we can see your slides. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and start. Okay. Hi everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to this uh, this webinar. As um, I'm going to talk about global and regional drought from uh, the CMIP five models, but as Dan mentioned, I'm going to talk very briefly about the current activities of the CMIP five task force evaluations at the moment. Um, so um, I'm going to give a couple of slides on that and then, and then talk about the work we're doing at Princeton. So the CMIP-5 task force, some of you may be aware and some of you may be involved with this, is basically taking um, nine forces of, of funded PIs who are working on the CMIP-5 data um, forming those into a task force so we can actually attack questions that we couldn't answer as individuals or it's not on our immediate goals to do that. So it's basically combining forces together. So the, the goal at the moment is to evaluate CMIP-5 historical simulations, projections and the decadal predictions as well. And we're doing that via um, three papers that are to be submitted by the, the deadline that uh, Dan mentioned at the end of July uh, to a Journal of Climate Special Issue on CMIP-5 North American Climate. And these three papers are listed here. The first one is on the 20th century evaluations of these models. The second one is on the 21st century projections. And then the third paper is an analysis of the decadal hindcast and forecast as well. So. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is drawing from CMIP-5 MAP funded PIs, and we're trying to synthesize across a range of climate features that are um, relevant to North America. So here, um, I've mainly been involved with the first paper, which is the 20th century evaluations. And on the right is a, um, a figure showing a poster that was presented at the WCRP CMIP-5 workshop that was held in Hawaii uh, back in March, and this shows some of the initial results from the task force for 
uh, paper one and paper two, so that's the 20th century evaluations and also the 21st century projections. And I've listed on the left, you can actually see in those figures that there's a whole bunch of different analyses going on. Um, and I've listed on the right um, what those analyses are, and I've grouped them into different categories. So we're looking at continental climate, so basic climate variables such as precipitation and temperature, uh, sea surface temperatures, system wet and dry spells, and a bunch of uh, climate features that are particular to different regions, <coughs> such as east coast winter storms, uh, north coast <coughs> or extremes in the southeast. Hi, Justin. I'm sorry to interrupt, but it sounds like not everyone's phone line is uh, muted. Please check and make sure that your phone is muted if you're not, Justin. Thanks. Okay, and we're also looking at um, climate uh, variability on different scales as well, so intra-seasonal and also longer time scales from interannual to decadal variability and, and trends in some of those basic climate variables as well. So this is, this is ongoing work. We're hoping to meet this deadline of the end of July and submit those three papers um, covering a broad range of climate features relevant to North America. Okay, so um, the rest of this presentation is about our work here at Princeton uh, looking at global and regional drought from CMIT-5. And what we're trying to do is evaluate the contemporary climate simulations and see if there's implications for the future projections uh, into the 21st century, see if we can understand some of the uncertainties and the robustness of, of those projections. Um, so a little bit of background. So we know that drought causes uh, large impacts to agriculture, water supply, economies, and ecosystems. And there's been some speculation um, that droughts have increased over the past 30 or so years due to uh, global warming forcing higher evaporation. And there's an expectation that droughts will become more frequent and intense into the future. And um, I'll show some of those results from the CMIP-5 and CMIP-3 in, in a couple of slides. Mm -hmm. So we, we tend to look at drought in terms of soil moisture, um, in part because it's a good aggregate measure of the land hydrological cycle, but also because it's a key variable of the climate system uh, for a number of reasons, including that it constrains transpiration and photosynthesis in many parts of the world, uh, and this has impacts on water, energy, and biogeochemical cycling. And secondly, it acts as a storage for anomalies in precipitation and radiation, and we end up with persistence in, um, in soil moisture, which can feed back to the climate system. Um, so we see it as a key player in feedbacks at local to regional to global scales and uh, can play a role uh, in climate change projections into the future. So the approach of the, the analysis I'm going to show today, it, it's, it's fairly um, initial. Uh, this is an overview of the data and methods that we've been using. So as I said, we have a focus on soil moisture uh, as well as other components of the terrestrial water cycle and the linkages between those. And we've basically done an analysis of drought characteristics in the CMIP-5 models. Now, those drought characteristics, uh, there's a little cartoon over on the right here, um, which um, you know, shows what those characteristics are. So if you take a time series of a hydrological variable, such as soil moisture, and then you pick a threshold below which you say uh, a drought is occurring, um, then you can define a number of characteristics of that drought, including the duration, uh, the instantaneous magnitude, and then you can calculate things like the severity, which is the duration times the average magnitude over the uh, length duration of the drought. And you can also calculate some other characteristics, such as the spatial area in drought at any time. So we've done some evaluations. This is number four here. Some evaluations of the CMIP-5 models against uh, offline land surface modeling. This is kind of our baseline. Uh, we've tended to use the VIC land surface model, which we are most familiar with at Princeton, but we've also been looking at uh, other land surface models to get an idea of the uncertainties if you use a different model. And these uh, simulations are forced by observations over the U.S. and a hybrid observational reanalysis data set globally. And so we've been trying to diagnose the differences in the CMIT-5 simulations in terms of climate variability as well as um, the, the terrestrial dynamics, particularly the soil moisture dynamics. And this is kind of building on work we did for CMIP-3. Uh, over on the right here is a paper from Climate Dynamics in 2008, 
that looked at the projected changes in drought occurrence from the CMIP-3 model. So we're, we're trying to build from that and looking at CMIP-5. So I'm going to start by looking at the, uh, the future projections for drought and soil moisture. Uh, so here I'm showing the results for uh, CMIP-5, which is in the, 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 the right column of each panel here and here, uh, for the RCP 8.5 scenario, which is at the upper end of the range of scenarios in terms of the radiative forcing by the end of the 21st century. And we also have some data um, from that previous study for CMIP-3. This is for the A2 scenario, which is kind of equivalent to the 8.5 in CMIP-5, uh, because it's also at the upper uh, limit of the range of scenarios. So the, each of these time series is over the 20th to the 21st century, and they show global average values of soil moisture and then drought extent and a number of other drought characteristics. So this is the frequency here of short-term drought, that's four to six months, frequency of longer-term drought, that's 12, more than 12 months, and then the mean severity. And I'm going to talk about some of these characteristics throughout the, uh, throughout the talk. And you can basically see uh, this is the range across the models is the shading, the median is the, is the black line. And you can basically see that soil moisture goes down for just, just about all models in both CMIP3 and CMIP5. And we get a commensurate increase in all these drought characteristics as the soil moisture dries. Now, some interesting things here, different from uh, CMIP3, is that we see for the soil moisture in CMIP-5, there's a bunch of models that actually show an increase in soil moisture. Um, this occurs over high northern latitudes, and it turns out that the models that do this are the ones from high latitude modeling centers. So this is basically uh, the Canadians, the Norwegians, and the Russians. Now, this may actually be a problem with the data or my interpretation of the data, uh, or they may actually know what they're, uh, they're doing in their own backyards. And so that's an interesting feature that needs to be looked at in a bit more detail, which I need to do. Um, there is a comment at the bottom here. Uh, droughts tend to increase everywhere, despite higher annual precipitation in some places, particularly in higher latitudes. And I'll talk about this a bit more in the next two slides, where we look at the spatial patterns of these future projections. Um, so again, we have CMIP-3 on the left and CMIP-5 on the right. Uh, these panels, these maps are showing the uh, mean drought duration for different 30-year periods. So we have a 20th century period here, mid-21st and end of 21st century at the bottom. And we can see as we go through in time, um, we see an increase in the, in the duration of uh, droughts, mean duration of droughts. Uh, particularly in subtropical regions where the models are projecting less precipitation coupled with more evapotranspiration as well. Uh, we see that CMIP-5 is pretty similar to CMIP-3. Um, up in higher latitudes, we see that mean drought duration actually decreases, and that's mainly because of this increase in precipitation annually in those regions. Now, if you flick to a, a similar plot, this is now for short-term drought frequencies. So this is the number of four to six months droughts within that 30-year uh, period. Um, so CMIP-3, CMIP-5 again, and then the three 30-year periods in the 20th, 20th century through to the 21st century. Again, we see this increase frequency of short-term droughts in these subtropical regions. It's slightly less for the CMIP-5. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, but we also see in higher latitudes we see that the frequency of short-term drought is quite low in the 21st, 20th century, and then it actually increases into the 21st century. And this is mainly because of summertime drought, and because although we may be getting more precipitation annually in the projections, we're actually getting a seasonal effect, the increasing temperatures causing earlier melting of the snowpack and less soil moisture in the summer. So there's a, a seasonal factor factor in there that needs to be taken into consideration despite this annual increase in precipitation. So given these future projections, what can we say about their uncertainty and the robustness of those projections? You know, we saw there was quite a lot of variability amongst the models, even though they all said things would increase in terms of, of drought. So we've been doing some evaluations, as I said, in the, in the beginning few slides against our land surface modeling. Um, here, 
This is the frequency of short-term droughts again over um, a 30-year period in the 20th century. I think this is uh, 61 to 90 or 70 to 2000 again. Um, so on the left, we have the land surface model, forced by observations. On the right, we have a selection of CMIP-5 models. So this is the frequency of short-term droughts. And we see that in the east, we have a higher frequency of short-term droughts. In the west and midwest, we have a lower frequency. This is mainly due to differences in uh, climate variability. So higher uh, frequency variability over in the east causes more short-term droughts. And then we have a kind of longer decadal variability in the west, which causes a, uh, a lower frequency of short-term droughts. We see from the CMIP-5 models that as an aerial average, they look, they're probably pretty similar. But the actual spatial patterns are, are quite different uh, versus the land surface model forced by observation. And there are particular models where we get zero frequencies in the kind of Midwest, and we see an overestimation in other models. Even though they might be getting the spatial patterns correct, there are some overestimations. Um, the next panel is similar, but now we're looking at long-term droughts. So this is droughts that last for longer than 12 months. Again, we have the VIC offline model here, forced by observations, CMIP-5 models here. Uh, and we see there's a maximum of longer-term drought frequencies in the west and up into the Canadian prairies. We see from the CMIP-5 models, overall, they tend to overestimate the frequencies, although they do get the spatial patterns somewhat similar to what we see from the, uh, our baseline offline model here. So this slide here, we've actually done this globally and for regions around the globe. So this is basically showing the same thing. The top panel is short-term drought frequencies. The bottom is the longer-term drought frequencies. And each of these bars uh, refers to a global average and then different regions around the world. Um, and then the ones highlighted here are North American ones. So Western North America, Central North America, and Eastern North America. And we're showing also the CMIP-3 multimodal ensemble as well, the uh, box and whisper plot uh, versus the CMIP-5, and then the VIC offline, our baseline is the black dots. And we see for the frequency of short-term droughts that the, the models do a reasonable job in getting the regional uh, variation correct, although there is quite a large spread across the models. If you look at the longer-term droughts, then they tend to overestimate uh, the frequencies versus the offline model. So we've been trying to diagnose why that is and whether that makes sense or not. One way of looking at this is, is to look more generally at persistence in soil moisture. So we calculate that as the average number of months spent in dry anomalies. So this is a very basic uh, statistic. And again, we look at the land surface modeling results here. We see a higher persistence in the drier regions of the west and the southwest, where moisture tends to persist uh, in the dry regime for longer than in the east over here. So we have lower persistence here. And then if we look at the models, we see, again, we see a wide variety of spatial patterns and magnitudes. Some models overestimate persistence everywhere. Uh, other models get something that's fairly similar, but again, overestimate persistence. So we see a wide variety in the spatial patterns and the magnitudes here. So Hi, Justin. This is about a two-minute warning. Two minutes. Okay. I better speed up. Thanks. Okay. So we've tried to diagnose these differences um, by looking at individual models. Um, so here we're looking at the time series over this 30 or maybe it's a 50-year period. Um, the offline model here again, our baseline, and then the three regions, eastern, central, and western. And then three selected models that show different kinds of uh, responses. And we see this difference in variability. So more decadal variability in the west, higher variability in the east. First model here actually has a trend. So this is quite spurious. There may be a problem with initialization the conditions. Model two does a little better in its decadal variability in the west and its higher frequencies in the east. And I think model three is, is, uh, is fairly close. So a number of issues there depending on the model that we look at. We've also been looking at seasonal water budgets for these different regions to try and see if we can understand some of these differences. And we see some, so again, the three regions uh, looking at soil moisture, precip, evaporation, and runoff. The key things here, we see different dynamics over the season uh, from the models versus the offline model. 
uh, higher precipitation in the west than the models, and overall higher evapotranspiration in, in all the models in all regions versus our, our VIC model, although there's some uncertainty, especially in the east in our land surface model. And then some uh, disparities with the runoff that's related to uh, the timing of snow melt, especially in the west. Um, okay, I'll just flick through these last few. We've also looked at partitioning of precipitation into evaporation and runoff, so uh, Q over P is basically the runoff ratio. And we see some similar features between our baseline and these selected models, perhaps a little bit too broad in this kind of minimum runoff ratio that we see in the, in the, uh, in the Midwest in our uh, land surface model. Uh, but overall, it's not too bad, actually. Um, finally, a couple of figures showing correlations between precipitation and other land budget components to try and diagnose the feedbacks between uh, these different components. And on the top line, we have the, uh, our baseline land surface model, and these are correlations for winter time with runoff, evaporation, and soil moisture. Um, I won't go through the details here, um, but basically the models do a reasonable job with runoff and soil moisture on differences in evaporation in the winter that could be to do with snow and sublimation. And then if we get through to the summertime, warm season, June, July, August, uh, we see more variability going on here between the uh, models and the baseline. Um, particular models showing too strong coupling between, say, precipitation and evaporation, uh, or no coupling at all uh, in other models between uh, precipitation and evaporation in some regions. So just to quickly summarize and uh, conclude, uh, future projections show increased drought occurrence uh, globally, and particularly in many subtropical regions, and the CMIT-5 results are, are reasonably similar to the CMIT-3 results. Uh, CMIT-5 models do a reasonable job at capturing the regional variation, 20th century drought characteristics, although there's a large spread across the models, uh, but encouragingly we see a lower spread in CMIT-5 versus CMIT-3. <laughs> Hi, someone on the phone, uh, we can hear you speaking. Please make sure that your phone is muted. Thank you. Okay. Um, number three, a tendency to over-predict over the frequency of long-term drought, which may be due to differences in climate variability from the models and or land processes, specifically the soil moisture dynamics. Some models have issues with soil moisture drift, others have issues and there are biases in the phase and amplitude of seasonal cycles of the land components, and there are some hints that filtering of precipitation through the land contributes to differences in soil moisture persistence. So our future work is to delve more deeply into diagnosing these differences, uh, particularly looking at climate variability versus land processes, and then apply this to the future projections and look at changes in P, versus changes in evaporation and the complications of seasonality, especially with snow. So that, that's it. Thanks for your attention. Okay. Thanks a lot, Justin. That was very interesting. Um, I'd like to remind everyone on the phone that uh, we hold questions until the end. So if you have a question specifically for Justin, please write it down so that you remember it for the uh, end, and we'll try to have a discussion session. Um, I could still hear somebody whispering in what sounded like Chinese, perhaps, if that helps narrow it down. Um, so please, everyone, make sure that your phones are muted. And we're going to move now to Yolanda Sarah. Um, Yolanda, are you on the line? I am. Okay. <clears throat> so I'm going to try transferring control over to you right now. Okay. Can you see my desktop? Yeah, we can see it. Um, okay. You're just a, a, a little bit soft in terms of volume, so I don't know if you can move the phone closer. Okay. Anything. How's that? Uh, that's a little bit better. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about some metrics of uh, looking at these models um, in the Inter-America Sea and in the North American monsoon regions. Um, my graduate student, Carrie Guile, has been doing um, a lot of this work, especially on the monsoon. Um, okay. Um, we started with um, looking at a paper by Leong et al. from Journal of Climate 2008, and much of our monsoon work was sort of mimicking what th their analysis so that we could compare with CMIP-3 results. 
so you'll see a lot of their results in this talk as well. The upper panel here is our box for our North American monsoon analysis. It's generally considered about the core monsoon region. It's comparable to the Liang et al. box down here. And um, our observ observations are from the what's a new product called the PNOAA product, which um, is a gridded precipitation data set. It's at half a degree spatial resolution and monthly time resolution, and it was created from station data. And um, it's uh, the if you, you can see it as the kind of thin solid line in the Higgins et al. paper that showed or the Higgins et al. Um, data set here is the heavy black line. That's what Leong et al. used for their data, um, for their observations to compare with the models. And our data set is this other line here. So interestingly, Higgins uh, or Leong et al., they chose this study period for their comparisons from 1961 to 1990 very purposefully to pull out where um, some of these observations, the Douglas, Art Douglas is who provide the, provides the data from Mexico to the PNOA product. That's why this product is on the same as their Douglas product uh, labeled here in this other figure. Um, and so there, there are some differences in these data sets, particularly at the beginning and end of this study period they chose. However, we chose our study period to match the um, task force, the MAP task force, which Justin spoke about, um, historical period that we're focusing on to evaluate the CMIP-5 models. So um, I, it'll, it's interesting. I, I'll show you why. Uh, just keep in mind that our PNOA product over is higher than this Higgins product um, in our time for part of our time period, and otherwise agrees. And that'll be interesting when we look at some of the models' um, biases. Okay. So what Leong et al. did, it was a nice study, and they, they took the, the monthly uh, precip and they created an average seasonal uh, cycle of, NAM pre of precipitation in, in the NAM core region. And then they looked at um, lag correlations, and they chose the, um, where, the la where the correlation was maximum with the observations. That was the uh, phase lag that, um, that indicated the phase lag in the model. So, um, for instance, here we have a, a two phase lag, which means that the peak in the precipitation was um, two months after it was in the observations for this particular model. Okay, so, so they do a phase lag um, or a phase error um, evaluation and then just a standard root mean square error evaluation of all of these models is, are the models that they looked at. If we look at, um, so, whoops, sorry, our, um, our models are selected from these colored boxes just to show the overlap with their study. We, um, obviously the models don't correspond one to one, so the highlighted boxes here indicate the modeling centers where we were able to get um, CMIP-5 uh, monthly precipitation from them for the historical period. So that's our overlap. We have fairly, uh, we have a fairly good overlap. I think if you consider this is all, these are all GIS models here, even though there's quite a few of them from CMIP-3, it's all the same modeling center. Okay. So here are our results um, for the CMIP-5 historical period. The phase error is on top here, and you can see the phase errors, I'm going to go back for just a minute. The phase lags or phase errors in the CMIP-3 historical period were hovering around twos and ones. It's quite a few models um, had some sort of phase lag, um, whereas if you look at the, C the CMIP-5, they're hovering closer to one. There's a few with a four. Uh, a th there's one with a four, one with a three, one with a two. Otherwise, it's all one or zero. So it looks to me, at least with this subset of models we've looked at, there's been some improvement on the phasing of the um, seasonal cycle in the Coronam region for these models. The RMS errors, however, are still can be quite large. Um, but again, there seems to be some improvement if we go back and look there's you know these phase errors are, are excuse me RMS errors are all hovering um, around uh, you know better much better than one closer to two but ours are um, uh, quite a few are down around one um, and then if you look at the biases which they don't they didn't calculate but we went ahead and bi calculated the annual biases um, 
those are still problematic. There's still many models overestimating precipitation. And if you recall, our period that we're choosing for this comparison, our data set, the PNOAA, was actually higher in its estimates of precip for the region than, um, than even the Higgins data set. So um, th this is something that needs to be paid attention to. Okay, so if we just step through to try to understand the improvements of the CMIP-5 to the CMIP-3, um, here I'm showing models in this figure are models that haven't really changed from CMIP-3 and are showing fairly good results. There's low phase errors for this the Canadian and the um, had Hadley Center models. Their root mean square errors are um, around one or less, um, and their biases are, but their biases are in two different directions. The Canadians underestimate, and Hadley now overestimates. Um, so, but anyway, these models have are fairly similar to the CMIP three versions or sent, um, of these models. If we go and look at some models, have improved. So I wanted to highlight those. The um, CCSM4 is an improvement on NCAR's previous um, contributions, which are shown here for the CMIP3. They had all of them had um, positive phase errors in the in the previous versions, and the new CCSM has a has a smaller one. It's not two; it's one, and it's actually in the opposite direction now. But the um, RMS errors are smaller, and um, they don't show bias. But the the bias is still positive, but it's not as large as some of these other models. The CNRM and the CSIRO are also improved over, with no phase errors, improved over um, their counterparts in CMIP3, either for their phase or their RMS error. Okay. Um, this collection of models haven't changed, and they, um, they're still not, they're not, um, they could use some improvement. Um, MPI had larger um, RMS errors and continue, continue to have large RMS errors, although they have no phase error. The Maroc uh, models um, continue to have phase and RMS errors, and then, but their biases indicate that a lot of these RMS errors are canceling each other out in the two seasons. And we'll look at that when, when I, it, later in the talk. INM has very little bias. It's because it, the season and the phasing is completely off for this model, and uh, we'll look at that. And it hasn't really improved at all since the, um, since the previous version, the CMIP-3. Okay, GFDL, um, similar to the previous ones, hasn't really improved. It has large RMS errors, some of the largest ones in the group, and, and a phase error. Phase errors haven't improved. So um, these models have not uh, changed much. And then finally, if we look at the, this one I highlighted, the MRI was the best model in CMIP-3's comparisons for this study, the Leong et al. study. No phase errors, very small RMS. Now uh, the RMS errors have gotten larger, and there's a slight phase error. So um, this is the one model that seems to have gone the wrong way. <laughs> OK, so if we do bring these all together, um, and we look at the CMIP-5 models with a small phase error, these are small, really, it's zero. The, the monthly um, phase lag is zero. Um, you can see that, um, whoops, sorry, the MPI here for instance, was also on this the list of small phase errors for the Leong et al. study for the CMIP-3. And it also was overestimating the um, warm season rainfall in the region. But now it seems to overestimate it even more than it used to. Um, the UKMO, so the Hadley Center, um, was underestimating. And now it's overestimating. So some of these models have just flipped from one side to the next. but. Um, CSIRO um, has shows fairly good agreement here in the warm season and was overestimating before. So this is, remember, this was a model I pointed out that had improved um, since the previous versions. And then the Canadians always were underestimating. They underestimate a bit more now, but their winter precip, which is very important. Most of these models overestimate the winter precipitation in the region. And uh, the Canadians have much improved on, on that from their previous version, which is here where you can see they've, they've got a winter peak. OK. So if we look at the large phase error, to, to look at the, the worst models, I suppose, in this region, um, let me bring up the INM is the only model on this list that's on both of them. That's the one I pointed out earlier that hasn't really improved. And you can see that, most of the, that all of these models that have this large phase error, what's happening is they're peaking their precipitation in the fall or winter 
with very little, um, you know, there's no indication of a monsoon peak except maybe in this model, but it's very small. These, it's just um, continuing. The precipitation continues to rise into the fall. Um, I don't know if you want to call that a monsoon that's late, or <laughs> it's hard to evaluate these models. This, um, the Norwegian model is also very difficult um, to understand where um, we have to look at the patterns in the model to understand why the precipitation is so, um, the seasonality of it is so off. Okay. Um, so what we're doing is in order to look at projections, we don't care to use the models that don't have a, a monsoon. So we've selected the models with the small phase error in our group to look at our projections. And I just wanted to compare it with what was in the previous um, versions, the CMIP-3, um, the best model um, from this uh, study was the MRI. And you can see how nicely the MRI ensemble members are lying on top of the observations for this study. Um, what we've done is we've taken an average of our zero phase, um, zero phase group, and that's this heavy gray line here. And you can see the winter precip is, the, is a problem in this average. It's, there's too much of a maximum uh, peak in winter precipitation. But otherwise, um, the monsoon is at least captured here, um, similar to what uh, the MRI uh, was doing in the previous, in the CMIP-3. Okay, so if we take that, that grouping then, and we look at future projections. Now, I'm just going to look at the 2070 to 2090 period. Again, this is a period um, roughly corresponding to the um, task force um, future period. And I'm, there's also a mid-century one at uh, 2034, 2035 to 2064, which I, I'm not going to show in this, in this short talk. But um, for the, and this is the RCP 4.5 um, scenario, warming scenario for these models. So if we look at, I'm going to talk about the annual change first. So the annual changes are, there's not a lot of agreement amongst the models as to whether this region is going to have more or less precip um, on the annual average. And for some, for some of that, um, for instance, in the MPI, it, it's, it seems to be that uh, it's saying it's going to dry up, and it's, this model um, bar is about as large as this. So the RMS errors are indicating that throughout the year there's drying, whereas in some, like the Maroc um, 5 here, there's a net very little change, but large RMS differences, I shouldn't call them errors, excuse me, they're differences from the historical period. And so that indicates that one season is wetter and one season is drier, and so you're getting no changes. So this needs to be looked at more carefully, similarly for the CNRM. Um, what this, what's controlling the seasonality of the precip in these models, both in the historical and in the future period, what has changed? It has to be looked at um, with the dynamics in mind to better understand the um, discrepancies in these models. And we're going to be doing some of that work in the next um, month or so here. Okay. All right, so I'm going to jump on then to um, talking about the um, storm tracks in the region. Um, so that's another way we've been evaluating these models. Part of this study is to understand a shift in the storm tracks that was seen in the CMIP-3 models to see if it exists in the CMIP-5 models and then to understand the impact on uh, rainfall in the region, including the North American monsoon, which is impacted by uh, easterly wave activity in the East Pacific. So that's the link, and that's why we're looking at both of these features in the course models and what we are doing currently is, is downscaling these models to cool. obtain better precip and, um, and um, estimates of the this tropical storms in the region. But for now, we're just, I'm just showing you the course model results. So here we have um, the historical period again, the average, the track densities as calculated um, using relative vorticity at 850 hectopascal in these models and we track um, P42 smoothed relative vorticity from the models just to eliminate very small systems. We were interested in the main storm track and systems of some duration. So um, here, this is the ERA interim results. This is one and a half degree data at six hourly. This, all the tracking is done on six hourly data. Um, this is, um, and the models I have right now um, where I, I can obtain six hourly pressure level data are shown here, the Canadians, the MPI, Hadley Center, and the MRI, uh, CGCM3. 
So we can see there's some variety in intensity. They're all capturing um, the base, this kind of uh, maximum feature here along the west coast of Mexico and Central America. But the Canadian model very much overestimates the uh, storm track activity in the East Pacific and underestimates it in the Atlantic. Hadley's also underestimating it. I shouldn't say the Atlantic, the Caribbean. Um, but um, Hadley's capturing the East Pacific uh, relatively well. It seems to underestimate it here um, in the, towards the Central Pacific. Um, MRI seems to be doing one of the better jobs here of capturing the, the activity across the region. And MPI is also doing fairly well, although it's capturing um, some tr storms. It's predicting more storms tracking up um, into Hispaniola and um, it, along the east coast of the U.S., which we need to look at that. It could be where the positioning of the subtropical high in this model and its uh, strength that may direct the storms that way. Okay. So if I then we can look at mean strength along these tracks. And you'll notice the strength uh, peaks, uh, the peak in strength tends to be out north of, in both basins, it's north of the main track. And that's because it's probably picking up the stronger storms that are really um, more hurricane-like, although we try to eliminate those um, from this tracking uh, system. So, but, but you can see that the, the mean strengths are reasonably captured. MPI seems to have the strongest storms. Um, but the Canadians who were overestimating activity seem to be capturing strength rather, rather well here, and, and it's too weak here. Okay. So if then if we go to the um, the track, the the shift in the track to see if it is present. Well, for these models, it is especially for Hadley and Canadian in the Canadian model, we see a shift of the storm track southward. Um, with these models. There's somewhat of an indication of that with MRI and MPI, although it's, um, it's much weaker in these models than in, in the Hadley and Canadian models. Now, there was a study by um, Bengison et al. Um, or Bengis, yeah, Bengison et al. that looked at um, these, these kinds of these tracks and the shift in the tracks for the CMIP-3 models, and they found the same the same shift, and so our, our study is interested in what that means to the North American monsoon and to hurricane formation in the East Pacific because you're pulling the tracks off of the Sierra Madre and um, you're also pulling them away from Baja where a lot of these storms will then, if they do spin up into tropical storm strength, will tend to go up this way, track this way, and impact um, rainfall in, in the North American monsoon um, several studies have shown that the that the um, the storm tropical storms in the East Pack will um, okay. will then become rainfall in the North American monsoon region. They they create events in that region. So our study continues to then downscale these models. Uh, we're starting with Hadley. We've got almost the entire historical period downscaled now to then look at how this shift is going to be impacting those those um, more the rain in the region which we feel was best um, looked at with a high resolution run rather than um, the course models. Okay, that's all I had. How am I doing on time? I think that's a little bit over, Yolanda. Okay, all right. But thanks a lot for the presentation. That was great. Um, so we're going to move on to the next speaker now, which is Ginny uh, Yu. Ginny, are you on the line? Ajin Yi, are you there? Um, you may have your phone muted. Can you just check and unmute it? Okay, so I, I don't hear Jin Yi on the line, so um, hopefully... Can you hear me? Yes, hi, are you there? Yeah, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, sorry, yeah. I'm going to switch uh, control of the WebEx over to you right now. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, we can see your desktop. Can you still hear me? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the two type of answer in simplified model and their different impact on North America winter temperature. And in this study, you want to uh, look at the two type of animal, which um, including the Eastern Pacific type that has uh, SHT anomaly spray from the South America coast, 
to the Ninia 3 region, and the Central Pacific El Nino that has SST anomaly most around the uh, international day night over the Ninia 4 regions. So we first use a regression EOF method to extract the sea surface temperature anomaly from these two types of the ENSO. And the detailed method is explained in our Gao and U paper. So after we obtain the uh, SST anomaly pattern for each type of the El Nino, we scale the uh, loading coefficient by the square root of the icon value of the EOF. So the value we show in the EOF pattern represent the standard deviation or the actual SST variability for each type of the El Nino. So we can use this uh, EOF pattern to find out the intensity of each type of El Nino. For example, the result shown here is calculated from the ER SST data set. So based on this uh, calculation, the central, pers oh, I think the title is wrong. On the left hand side is the Eastern Pacific El Nino. The maximum SST anomaly is about uh, one degree C. And for the Central Pacific El Nino on the right hand side, the maximum SST anomaly is about 0 0.7 degree C. So based on this method, we find out the uh, intensity of these two type of ENSO from the uh, semi 3 model and semi 5 model. So here I'm comparing the pre-industrial simulation. So in the figure, the X coordinate is intensity for the CPL Nino, and Y coordinate is the intensity of the EPL Nino. So we notice that in semi 3, the model are separate into two groups. One group has a relatively weak ENSO intensity around 0 0.5 degrees C, another group with a stronger intensity. So in the semi 3, uh, there is a larger intermodel difference in terms of simulation of the two type of ENSO. So when we go to the semi 5 model, we notice that this smaller group in the semi 3 seems to merge more close to the other group. And now in the semi 5 model, we have uh, pretty much one single group in terms of the intensity of these two type of ENSO. And we don't see a, a group with a very weak ENSO intensity that is less than 0 0.5 degrees C. So from this figure, we notice that uh, one improvement from the CIMI-3 to CIMI-5 model is that the model seems to be more consistent or more performance become more converged to each other in terms of simulation of the two types of the ENSO. And then we want to compare uh, the amplitude of the two type of ENSO between the CIMI-3 and CIMI-5 model. And here we are calculating the, calculating the multi-model mean of the intensity. So for the Central Pacific El Nino, we notice that the CIMI-3 and CIMI-5 produce pretty much the same intensity, which is already very close to the observed intensity about 0 0.7. But for the Eastern Pacific El Nino, both CIMI-3 and CIMI-5 model underestimate the intensity of the Eastern Pacific El Nino. However, we notice that when we go to the CIMI-5 model, the red one, the uh, intermodal difference, uh, which is represented here by the, the uh, standard deviation of the intensity. So in the CIMI-5 model, the, the standard deviation is smaller compared to the CIMI-3 model. So the simulation of Eastern Pacific El Nino in the CIMI-5 model seems to have a smaller difference between uh, among the, all the models. That's also another uh, improvement we notice in the CIMI-3 model. So here we want to next look at the how these two type of ENSO respond to the global warming by comparing the, their mean intensity from the pre-industrial simulation to the historical simulation and to the RCP 4.5 simulation. And the most obvious feature we notice is that the Central Pacific El Nino, the blue one, continue to increase from pre-industrial simulation, which is about 0 0.7 degrees C, to about 0 0.7 degrees C in the historical simulation, and will continue to increase to close to about 0 0.8 in the RCP 4.5 simulation. But for the Eastern Pacific El Nino, the red one, we notice that the intensity increase from pre-industrial to historical, and then will reduce back to about pre-industrial level when we come to the RCP 4.5 simulation. So the, re, the one conclusion we notice from this figure is that these two type of El Nino respond differently to the global warming. 
and which indicate that imply that the the generation mechanism for these two type of engines may be different, and that's why they respond differently to the global warming. And then we noticed we focused on the ratio of the intensity between these two type of El Nino by dividing the intensity of CP El Nino by the uh, EP El Nino. So we noticed that the ratio is about the same as all increased slightly from pre-industrial simulation to the uh, historical simulation, but it's, go it's project to increase quite dramatically in the RCP 4.5. When we are in the in the RCP 4.5 simulation, the ratio is about uh, close to 0 0.9. That means the C, uh, Central Pacific El Nino is going to have intensity very close to the intensity of the uh, Eastern Pacific El Nino. So both type of El Nino will equally will become equally important. So, so next, we want to see how these two type of the ENSO affect the global climate. And here we only focus on the impact on the U.S. winter temperature. So in the past, before we uh, separate El Nino into a two, two type, the traditional view of El Nino impact on U.S. winter temperature is that the El Nino is going to warm up the northern part of the United States, cooling down the southern part of the United States. So we have pretty much this north-south uh, contrast pattern. And the recent study by King Seymour she separated the impact into the uh, Eastern Pacific El Nino and Central Pacific El Nino. And she concluded that for the Eastern Pacific El Nino, the impact is very similar to the tra traditional one, which is warm to the north, cold to the south. But the Central Pacific El Nino will have a different impact <coughs> on U.S. temperature, which will warm the western part of the United States, cold the eastern part of the United States. So we want to do a similar thing, and but we, we are not going to uh, to use a composite as the way that King Simo did. So here, what we did is that we uh, regressed the U.S. winter temperatures generally separate much to two. <coughs> one is called Eastern Pacific El Nino Index, the other called Central Pacific El Nino Index. And those two index are actually the principal component of the EOF that we obtained from our regression EOF method. So we believe that these two index is probably more capable of separating these two type of El Nino in terms of their uh, temporal evolution. So after we regress the winter temperature to this index, two index, we notice that the impact pattern is uh, different from the one that uh, uh, report by King Seymour and also report by this traditional view. So when we have an Eastern Pacific El Nino happening, the winter temperature over the northeastern part of the United States, or particular around the Great Lake region, is going to warm. And then temperature over the southwestern part of the United States is going to cold. So we have this northeast warm, southwest cold pattern. So when El Nino switch to central Pacific El Nino, then the warming will move from northeast to northwest. Cooling will move from southwest to southeast. So we now have a northwest warm, southeast cold. So it depends on what type of El Nino, different part of the United States will receive different influence. This result was uh, based on a, a regression from 1948 to 2010. And the result may be because we use these two particular EP El Nino and CP El Nino index. So we do the second approach, which we force the anchor uh, CAM4 model with climatology SST in the control run, with the Eastern Pacific El Nino anomaly in the EP experiment, and in the third experiment, we add the Central Pacific El Nino into the climatology to force this k uh, 4 model. And each experiment has 10 members, and each member has 22 months, begin from the onset of El Nino to the peak of El Nino and to the decay of the El Nino. They want to see how the model tells us about the winter temperature response in the United States. And this is the result we get. The result is very similar to what we report in the regression analysis. So you see that when the model came for is forced by the Eastern Pacific El Nino, then the winter temperature anomaly in the United States is, has a warm in the northeastern part of the United States, cold to the southwestern part of the United States, similar to the one we report in the regression analysis, warm to the northeast, cold to the southwest. So in the model, when the model is forced by Central Pacific, Central Pacific El Nino, the temperature response in the United States 
is again switched to warming switch northwest, cooling switch to southeast, okay, which is also similar to the one we report in this uh, regression analysis. So we are pretty confident that uh, these two type of ENSO will have a different impact on the United States and in this particular uh, spatial pattern. So now we want to do the third approach to further confirm uh, these two different impacts. So now we don't want to do any impact study based on El Nino index or El Nino SST anomaly. We just want to examine the winter temperature anomaly in each individual case of the El Nino years. So here we show the we have eight Eastern Pacific El Nino from okay. about 1950. So we we show that the winter temperature after that El Nino event. And here we didn't order the El Nino event based on the year that happened. Instead, we order the event based on the intensity of El Nino. And that's because we, we know that El Nino is just one of the factors to affect the uh, winter temperature in, in the United States. Even without El Nino, the winter temperature anomalies can still differ from the uh, climatology. But during a strong El Nino year, the influence from El Nino on the winter temperature must be more obvious. So at, on the very top, we show the, uh, the, the strongest Eastern Pacific El Nino, 1997, then the second strongest, third strongest, fourth strongest continues going down. Yeah. See that for, this, for the strongest El Nino, 1997, after 1997, in the winter time, the northeastern part of the United States near the Great Lake region warm, southwestern part cold. 1982 doesn't show completely that pattern, but you still can see that there's a more contour line around this Great Lake region and more cooling over the southwestern part. And 1972 is very consistent with our regression pattern, warm to the northeast, cold to the southwest. 1986 is more or less that pattern too, warm to the northeast, cold to the southwest. <coughs> so based on this case study, the results also consistent with our regression uh, analysis. Uh, let's look at the Central Pacific El Nino. We have about 13 events here. And I only show the, uh, the top 12 event. So on the left hand side, at the fourth strongest Central Pacific El Nino, 2009. So we see warming in the northwest, cooling in the southeast. 1994 doesn't show that. But 1957, warming to the northwest, cooling in the southeast. 2002, warming to the northwest, cooling to the southeast. 2004, also same, the same thing. And 1991, show the same thing. So this case study also consistent with our regression result. So it's pretty much we believe that it is true that Eastern Pacific El Nino has this particular impact on the winter temperature in the United States and the Central Pacific has the other, way, uh, the other impact pattern. So now we want to see whether or not the simplified model can capture this different response. Hi, Jin Yi, this is a two minute warning. Okay, so we are when the temp temperature response to these two type of ENSO, so here we also again request the winter temperature to the uh, El Nino index in each of the model. And here are the uh, temperature anomaly for the East, Eastern Pacific El Nino and Central Pacific El Nino. We notice that some model, like the Norwegian model, they produce this warm northwest coast, uh, southeast very well, similar to this observation. And so, but this model only go to Eastern Pacific El Nino. The Norwegian model still show the same pattern. So it means this model always prefer to produce warm to the northeast, cold to the southwest. As warm to the northwest, cold to the southeast, no matter what kind of El Nino. But however, some of the uh, models like this uh, uh, Canadian model, during the Eastern Pacific El Nino is warm to the northeast, cold to the southwest. When it comes to the Central Pacific El Nino, warm to the northwest, cold to the southeast. So we want to quantify the similarity of this impact pattern in a model with observation by calculating the pattern correlation no. between the no. model pattern and observational pattern. So here in the X coordinate is a correlation related to the response, uh, impact US response to Central Pacific El Nino. Y axis is the US response to Eastern Pacific El Nino. So all the model, but we can see that my model didn't produce. Okay, well, we can hear people screaming in the background on the phone, so can everyone please make sure that their uh, phone is muted? And if you're having an emergency, please call 911. 
And this, uh, the perfect model, uh, if the model can capture this two type N, so they, they should have the top somewhere around this upper right corner near correlation of one. So most of the model didn't reach that point. However, if we just choose 0 0.45 correlation as a criteria, we still can find about uh, seven or eight models that capture the different response of US temperature to this and so. Okay, so at the end we want to define a best group of simplified model that we can use to study, to project how the US winter temperature may respond to the changing activity of two type ENSO. To do that, uh, to those, uh, this group of model, in order to be selected, then the model has first able to produce the two type ENSO based on their intensity. Second, the model's atmosphere has to be sensitive enough. They care about the location of the uh, ENSO warming and which is represented by this uh, uh, pattern correlation here. So based on these two analysis, we find out there is about six simplified models that can simulate both the two type of ENSO and their different impact on um, US winter temperature. And we are going to use this group of model to report the uh, future impact of El Nino on the US temperature. So the conclusion is that the simplified model still underestimate the intensity of Eastern Pacific El Nino, but their intermodal difference have been reduced compared to the semi three model. Second, the Central Pacific, Eastern Pacific El Nino respond differently to global warming, and the Central Pacific El Nino is project to become nearly as important as the Eastern Pacific El Nino in the RCP 4.5 simulation. And the in third point is that the increasing occurrence of the Central Pacific El Nino will make the northwestern part and southeastern part of the United States more vulnerable to the El Nino influence. And finally, we already identified six simplified models which we believe that can be uh, are suitable for the projection of future ENSO impact on the U.S. winter temperature. Yeah, that's the end of my uh, report. Okay, thanks a lot, Jania. It was very interesting. Um, our next speaker is David Nealon. David, are you on the line? I am, yes. Okay, great. I'm going to try switching control over to your computer. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm going to be running over uh, some of the issues with precipitation simulation in the global warming simulation and then using some ENSO teleconnection patterns to try and use a, um, you know, current day observations to say some things about the statistics. Um, in terms of the um, MAP task force, um, uh, Anna Rita Mariotti had asked us to uh, focus on some of our North American results. But I'm having a hard time hearing, David. Maybe speak louder or into the phone. Okay, I can volume up a little. Um, is that uh, is that any better? Better here. Okay. Um, so we volunteered in that context to provide some of the um, sort of basic statistics, like intermodal agreement, multimodal ensemble means. So I'll run over some of those basics, um, and then uh, try to put the um, sort of agreement or lack thereof in context with some of the uh, global or tropical statistics. And I should underline um, the contribution of Baird Langenbrunner, a uh, graduate student here, and Dave Myers from my group. Uh, and I'm having it, there we go. Momentary issue with this slide for it. So this is a um, global view of the uh, intermodal agreement on the precipitation patterns at the large scale uh, using the area shaded in blue is over four millimeters per day. So it highlights the um, uh, tropical convection zones and the storm tracks. And then each model's four millimeter per day contour is shown in different colors. Uh, so you get a sense that um, the models uh, have persistent problems in the familiar areas, uh, the extension of the North American storm track uh, has too much precipitation just before it hits the North American west coast, uh, but then picks up again to reasonable levels, and you have tropical issues uh, with the extensions of the South Pacific and South Atlantic convergence zones. If you zoom in on North America, 
um, this uh, contour plot uh, gives you a quick sense of where the models disagree, where the contours are, are more scribbly, uh, all in one plot. And you can see that um, track, for instance, the overall spatial pattern is not too badly simulated. And if you look at the black dashed line, the multi-model ensemble mean, uh, you have some uh, overestimate relative to the CMAP data set of the precipitation. Uh, but the positioning is not too bad. Uh, when you move down to June, July, August and focus on the uh, Caribbean region, as it moves up to the storm track, there are intermodal differences, but the large-scale spatial pattern is fairly reasonable. When you uh, move to a comparison of the spatial patterns of the model, one <coughs> way is to show the spatial patterns one on top of each other. So your eye detects the changes uh, very easily. The format here is the red curve uh, is the four millimeter per day contour from each model's climatology. Uh, the dark red colors are greater than three millimeter per day uh, difference uh, uh, um, from the end of century 30-year uh, average in the RCP 8.5 run uh, relative to a base period 1961 to 90. And then the blue to purple colors are large changes in precipitation. Um, and if we look at the models one after another, uh, if this animation is coming through on the um, uh, software, you can see that the jumping around uh, that characterizes this is telling you there's substantial disagreement in spatial pattern. And the trick is to uh, quantify that and tease out what you can from uh, the results. The multimodal ensemble mean, when you look at it from this global perspective in June, July, August, in the tropics, the um, uh, Caribbean Central American region is standing out as one of the uh, big problematic regions for precipitation decreases. And that's the same as uh, was found with the CMIP-3 ensemble back in, say, 2006. If you look at the winter, um, one of the interesting things is uh, the increases at high latitudes uh, on uh, this scale here are uh, fairly regional. Um, for instance, the increase in the storm track uh, is seen uh, broadly across the um, uh, North Pacific with just a slight shift, uh, you can see, as the decrease in precipitation off Japan. But this uh, little hook at the end of the storm track, uh, um, just as you hit California, is going to be of interest because that's showing an increase, and the question will be how trustworthy is that. So for perspective in the tropics, if you uh, calculate the intermodal agreement by taking the pattern correlation of each model with all the others and averaging that to provide one dot per model. Uh, if you're looking at the tropics in December, January, February, you're talking about less than 0.3, which is very bad agreement. That's what your eye picked up in that animation. In June, July, August, slightly better. We're talking about um, some making it slightly over 0.4, but it's still not very good. And a thing to note that um, uh, is worth coming back to a couple of times is if you look at that red dot, that's the amplitude, the RMS amplitude of the signal here in millimeters per day, uh, calculated from the multimodal ensemble mean pattern. And it very substantially underestimates the amplitudes uh, from the individual models. So in terms of looking at that multimodal ensemble mean pattern for precipitation, uh, one should take it as a, a severe underestimate of the, of the likely change and one needs other statistics to uh, engage that. Now, if we look at how the models do for ENSO, um, we're going to be looking at these in AMIP simulations, i.e., with observed sea surface temperature specified and looking at the teleconnected um, uh, patterns as a way of saying how the models do in precipitation where you can compare the observe and also uh, saying something about the statistics that are used to assess that. Here is the teleconnection pattern. In this case, it's just a um, rank correlation to Nino 3.4 sea surface temperature, we'll be looking at linear regressions uh, uh, down later. We've done this a couple of ways. And you can pick up uh, the region across North America um, here where you have uh, sort of uh, coming on to California and then extending across uh, increases over um, uh, the uh, Gulf states and uh, Florida. And then you have these decreases over uh, central, equatorial South America. Um, those will be two regions I'll, I'll show. If we show the models one after another again, you can see that the pattern of their uh, signal in the um, same rank correlation measure to Nino 3.4 or sea surface temperature jumps around a lot from model to model. And uh, so the question is, what can you draw out of these models in terms of agreement? 
if we look at the same sort of Taylor plot uh, measure uh, where we're doing, again, uh, spatial correlation of the tilt connection pattern uh, to observations in this case, and we have here the standard deviation, uh, the RMS uh, signal over the region uh, normalized by the observed, you can see that the models have not improved substantially in their simulation. In fact, in some cases, you, you can say that the, um, uh, there's a reduction in the uh, typical spatial correlation over the region shown. So the right-hand panel, uh, the, these are computed over this region of substantial signal in North America. In the left-hand panel, it's the uh, region with substantial signal uh, in equatorial South America and the part of the Caribbean. Um, and again, if you look at the, um, say, the open blue dot here, that's the multi ensemble mean uh, with its uh, spatial correlations, the observations doing somewhat better, but its amplitude severely underestimating the uh, amplitude, or quite substantially underestimating the amplitude seen in the observations. If we move to another measure, now this plot is a little complicated, but I just want to draw a couple of points. Uh, this is taking that amplitude measure and doing a couple of things to it. The thin bars are looking at when you have the same model and you have, say, five realizations, that's the two standard deviation error bar among those realizations. So you have one long thin bar for each model that has multiple runs. You can see that the models uh, are separated often by more than the, um, the error bar associated purely with internal variability. And this is an important thing to check because uh, with just the typical length of the observed SFP uh, series, you do get substantial year-to-year uh, -year variability or variability from time, from model run to model run just due to internal variability and precipitation. But if you look at the, um, the average of all the model RMS amplitudes, which is the green dot for CMIP5 and CMIP3 on the left and right of this respectively, you can see that the models over South America, North America, and also the Western Pacific Horseshoe are not too bad in estimating that amplitude, whereas the red dots, which are taking the multi-model ensemble mean first and then calculating the amplitude, are a severe underestimate. So in terms of the size of the typical precipitation signal, if not the exact spatial placement, the models are doing reasonably well, and presumably you can take that information and bring it to the uh, end of century assessment. Now here's another thing that surprised us. In 2006, we were arguing that one should not just be using the sign of the uh, agreement on the sign of the precipitation change as a measure of model agreement. You should also be conditioning on uh, measures of the uh, signal having a, a significant, uh, uh, passing a statistical significant test for the amplitude of the signal. And Tibaldi et al. has picked this uh, theme up again uh, last year. And, um, if we look at the plot on the lower left, uh, the regions that pass this 95% uh, significance test are fairly restricted if you're using the standard linear regression test uh, over North America. <coughs> America. If you look at the lower right-hand panel, um, the areas that pass the agreement on sign, uh, uh, number of models that agree with the observations on the sign is very extensive. So there's something interesting going on here that we don't fully understand, that the agreement on sign is better than you might think it is. And that's good news for assessing the end of the century trends, we think. All right, some basic things. So here's the multi-model ensemble mean uh, zoomed in on North America for June, July, August the high change over um, the Caribbean, Central American region. And here's the agreement on sign uh, shown for 13 models. They're not quite consistent because we don't have this statistic updated uh, uh, with the latest model. Um, and you can notice that the, this is agreement on uh, drying sign for red. Uh, so the very low numbers mean agreeing on a, a wettening change between the end of century and RCT 8.5 and the base period. Uh, so there's high agreement in that Caribbean, Central American region, and also reasonably high agreement at a couple of spots that have lower amplitude. For instance, uh, British Columbia has a cool spot there. And then, of course, high latitudes, uh, high agreement on, on a lightning signal, as Justin had mentioned. Uh, if you switch to DJF, um, here is the zoom on North American region of that multimodal ensemble mean uh, with this 
uh, interesting little hook region where the storm track actually extends downward uh, to cover California. Um, and here's the agreement on uh, the sign among those models. And you can see that you have uh, 12, 11 models uh, agreeing on the wetting over central and even down into southern California. Uh, if you, however, look at the um, uh, models individually, you notice there is a substantial difference in exactly how they do that storm track change. We're just looking at the same uh, uh, view for each model's precipitation change and a century relative to base period, and then the multi-model ensemble mean. Um, so there, uh, but within that, you had most of the models producing at that increase uh, uh, extending down into California, which would be very big news if you could trust it. And if you assess this with the uh, Taylor plot um, metric, again, looking at the intermodal agreement, so again, how the spatial pattern in each model has a spatially correlates with the other models, um, for instance, over this region uh, uh, that I was uh, shown on the uh, lower right corner there um, that focuses on the um, U.S. west coast, uh, extending out a bit into the ocean and across the U.S., um, you have uh, spatial correlations of up to uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, uh, which is much higher than we've been seen typically for other regions, even the ones that have large signal, much higher than the summer season for that same region. So there's some reason to uh, have um, uh, think that at the large scale you might want to trust something about these patterns. This is a latitude slice just in the ocean, just off the coast. Uh, so you're assessing the precipitation in the storm tracks as they come onto the coast. You might uh, worry about the uh, resolution of these models as they hit the coastal mountains, but this is as the uh, storms come into the coast. So you can see the overestimate in this region of the um, uh, in this CMAP observation shown as the black dash line, but the pattern being fairly reasonable in the historical period. And then if you look at the switch to the end of century, you can see that most models are increasing this amplitude in a fairly consistent manner. Um, there's only a couple of models that have a reduction in Southern California. The, the, the last band here is from the border of Mexico, almost to the border of Canada, so the California is the uh, left-hand side of this. Um, and that suggests that perhaps you might put some trust, at least at the large scale in this. Here's another view of the same thing, um, doing uh, principal component analysis on the model uncertainty pattern of patterns. This region is unusual in that 51% um, of the variance comes out in a single mode, which is this amplitude mode shown. Uh, this is evaluated over the domain that's uh, colored on this uh, um, uh, picture. The second mode is the gradient mode between the drying that you saw down uh, in Mexico and the strong uh, increase in precipitation you saw at higher latitudes. Uh, so the fact that it's, uh, they're disagreeing in amplitude rather than sign is also regarded as cautiously encouraging on uh, perhaps interpreting this and that brings me to my summary. Um, overall, the reduction in model uncertainty on precipitation seems to have been very slow uh, from CMIP 3 to CMIP 5. Um, in several measures, you have no improvements. Uh, and this, of course, raises fundamental questions about hydrological cycle sensitivity, et cetera. But focusing on the, on the North American sector, um, we at least have the models again agreeing on uh, a decrease in precipitation in the Caribbean Central American region that's coming up again as a very robust signal. But then there's this new uh, aspect of the North American West Coast in these large scale models uh, has this little hook of the storm track um, coming onto uh, California suggesting a possible precipitation increase. Uh, in uh, northern, down into central, or in some cases even into parts of southern California, um, with the uncertainty mostly in amplitude as opposed to the position of that gradient. And then I cut a couple of slides um, for uh, uh, purposes of time when I was fitting this into the 15 minutes. Uh, we also have some work on the onset of strong convection uh, and the way those statistics change under uh, global warming. So I'll just leave that as a teaser and uh, wrap it up now to keep us on time. Yeah, thanks a lot, David. And if we uh, have any time left, I mean, it's not looking likely that we're going to have time left, but if we do and somebody wants to ask a question for further information here, feel free to do that. 
Uh, so thanks a lot, David. I'm going to move on now to Tao. Tao, are you on the line? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to transfer control over to you. Can you see my PPT and hear me? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, thank you. So the topic of today is understanding the causes of answer symmetry using semaphorons. So answer symmetry is also referred to the residual of answer between its two faces in some other studies. It is a fundamental property of answer and which is observed of the larger magnitude during warm phase in contrast to the cold phase. So this picture is the warm phase and cold phase is residual and uh, <coughs> we can see that is a positive asymmetry in the eastern Pacific. And then this plot is the histogram shows that the linear three actually normally are skewed to the positive values. So the dashed line is the normal distribution. If the linear three anomaly follows uh, the normal distribution, the experience will be zero. So this plot shows the asymmetry for the subsurface. We have the plot from the uh, we have previous paper, 2009 paper. So this is one phase subsurface temperature and cold phase and uh, this is residual and the histogram of subsurface and industry as uh, long. We can see that there's a positive um, asymmetry in the subsurface. And then the subsurface industry alumnus are skewed to the positive values. And the maximum value can reach six degrees. So why is it important to evaluate enter symmetry? Uh, because the El Nino Lanina asymmetry provides a mechanism for answer to affect the tropic mean state. And understanding the causes and the consequences of answer symmetry is important to understand the decadal rapidity in the tropics and beyond. So, but an analysis of previous NCA models, system one, two, three, and the three plus NR. So we show that all models uh, underestimate as a symmetry, but the system three plus NR with near and rich scheme has significant improvements over early versions and enhanced the conversion over the east Pacific during one phase of ANSO appears to be the cause for the improvement. So the purpose of this study is to evaluate ANSO symmetry in CMF5, including its surface and subsurface signatures, and a test hypothesis developed from the previous analysis of ANCA models against the result from CMF5 models, and I try to understand the effect of model resolution on the simulation of ANSO symmetry. We analyzed the two versions of CSM4. So we use several ways to quantify the answer symmetries. Uh, this common one used the ASIC units. And then we also use a symmetricity uh, from the um, 2005 papers uh, defined as the variance weighted skewness. Uh, because the definition of symmetricity, variance weighted skewness can avoid the problem in the definition of skewness that small variance can cause the larger skewness. The symmetricity results are more consistent with the composite analysis. We also use our papers that composite analysis of anomaly during warm period and cold periods. The warm period defined as the linear three acid anomaly is greater than half degree, and the cold period defined as the linear three acid anomaly is greater than minus half degree. So we analyze couple control rounds from CMF5 and corresponding and map rounds. So this plot shows a uh, standard deviation and the skewness of an industry acid anomaly from carbon mode rounds. So this top one is standard deviation, the bottom one is skewness, the so black one is observation, and uh, then the purple one, this one is two degrees in four, and uh, this gray one is one degree in four. So we can see that the, the skewness, all the carbon the models and the estimates of the positive skewness. And then these two anchor models have a better simulation of skewness compared to other models. And then, but the variance, the, the six, two degrees in four have largest uh, variance, uh, so that the stronger variance does not guarantee a stronger skewness. You can see the skewness quite lower than the observations. So this is for your standard deviation asymmetricity, uh, variance weighted skewness. 
So you can see that this same, so the standard deviation is the same plot. And then we compare to this one, and then the simplicity uh, much, much stronger than this the two degrees in four. And so one degree uh, comparable, uh, this standard deviation has similar to operations. So the, we can show later that a simplicity result are consistent with the composite analysis. So this shows that this is SEC residual from one phase, between the warm phase and cold phase. So this top one is observations. So this bottom two is NCAR two version. This is one, ver one degree and two degree. So all the, most of the models underestimate the SEC residual and the two versions of NCAR models look better. And then compared to one degree version, a two degree version has a much stronger SEC residual. So this one, as you see, is more consistent with the SST asymmetry shown at the bar plot here. So this one shows the uh, subsurface temperature residual between warm phase and cold phase. So consistent with the SST residual, so, so two degrees, SN, two degrees seven four also has the strongest residual in subsurface temperature. And the other, all the other models are underestimate observed subsurface asymmetry. So <clears throat> to understand why, and then we analyze the warm phase. So this plot shows the composite SE warm normally from coupled rounds. So these observations, uh, so and then uh, all the models, and then two versions, I think the uh, looked better compared to the uh, SST uh, observed. You can see that, that most models have weak SST warm normalities over in the East Pacific, pretty weak in the East Pacific here, and then the uh, maximum center is shifted westward, but uh, this two NCAR model looks better. Then this one shows the composite subsurface temperature wa warm anomaly from a semi 5 carbon model. So very consistent with the uh, SNC warm anomalies. So subsurface warm anomaly is also weaker in most models, and the uh, mass center is shifted westward. And again, the two version, two degree of system 4 has the strongest um, subsurface uh, warm anomaly. So to better understand the acid asymmetry, so we plot the PTF pattern um, of uh, an industry as anomaly from observations and coupled models. So the, the thick one is observations, and the blue one, this one, two degree, and the, the green one is one degree. And we can see that two degree system ball has a longer tail on both sides, and the, gr the blue one. The maximum positive negative uh, anomaly can reach four degree and minus four degree, and a stronger positive anomaly is dominant. So let's, this is the reason why uh, have this two degree system four have much stronger uh, si asymmetry. We also see that most of models underestimate warm anomalies, and the bias for the uh, cold phase relatively small. So this plot is the precipitation and the zonal range stress residuals from the couple of models. And the shaded one is uh, precipitation and the counters are zonal wind stress. So we can see that uh, all, most of the models uh, underestimate the perceived and the zonal wind stress asymmetry. So and then compared to one degree, a version, and th this is the reason why most of the models underestimate the subsurface uh, symmetry, uh, subsurface temperature symmetry, because the, the wind stress precipitation is pretty small in uh, most of the models. So compared to one degree version and a two degree version, zonal wind stress much stronger and uh, in associated with stronger uh, precipitation convection uh, symmetry here in two, ver uh, two degree version. So to because in the couple of, uh, to understand whether the weak uh, symmetry in precip and the wind stress in couple of models is the cause or consequence of weak symmetry in corresponding NST. So we performed the composite analysis from a map around the force by observed acid forcing. So, so these observations are symmetry from a map around so observations, and then as most models have both bottom two is two two version of CSM4. So even forced by observed acid forcing, 
uh, we can say that uh, most models have a weak perceived uh, symmetry over the central and the east Pacific, uh, especially over the eastern Pacific. And then, <coughs> so but these two versions, CCM4, uh, looks better in the east Pacific, and then to have a better simulation of answer symmetry. So this plot gives give a quantitative measure of perceived asymmetry in the East Pacific. So the, to the top panel is for couple models, and the bottom one is a map run. So even <coughs> so enforced by observed as sourcing, so most models have a, a weak uh, perceived asymmetry in, in the East Pacific. So this error can, is amplified in couple round because the couple models have much weaker perceived asymmetry in the East Pacific. And then this result shows the perceived warm anomaly, uh, similar to the before, the residual, but for the warm anomalies, we can see, see that a map runs have a much, most of the models have a pretty weak uh, perceived response over the East Pacific. And then the couple of models, the error can amplify further. So the error, of the perceived symmetry pre weak in the East Pacific is mostly due to the warm phase. So this plot uh, shows the the difference between um, ensemble mean and map around warm anomalies um, and observations. So the top one is the precipitation, and the bottom one is on the wind stress. So we can see that the most of the have the weak perceived response. It's the negative values here. The in associated with the uh, perceived response, uh, uh, weak perceived response over East Pacific, the most stronger easterly winds over the East Pacific in a map round, so which may contribute to the weak warm anomaly of subsurface temperature in couple of rounds during warm phase. So this one shows the uh, the bias in the zone of wind stress in map rounds. So the top one is the mean uh, equatorial zonal wind stress. The bottom one is the skewness of uh, equatorial zonal wind stress. So this black one observations and this observation. So most of the models, the 14 or 50 models have a stronger uh, mean equatorial zonal winds. And then the most of the models also underestimate the positive skewness of our zonal uh, winds. So in a map rounds. So we give a summary of, of way of findings. So, so an estimate of answer symmetry is a common problem in, in CMFI models. So strong variance in linear three ST do not guarantee uh, stronger skewness in linear three ST. So one phase precipitation in the East Pacific is found to weak across the models, even in their uh, map runs. So uh, map runs also have systematic bias in the, both the mean and the annual variability of uh, equatorial zonal winds. So finally, we are planning to do next. Then we are, are trying to, uh, are going to do the carry out the fourth ocean model experience, use the surface winds from a map round, and then carry out the fourth atmospheric model round using symmetric SC forcing. Thank you. Oh, thanks a lot, Tao. That was a really excellent presentation. You even caught us up a couple minutes in time. We are a little bit after 2 o'clock now, so I'd like to thank all of the speakers. Okay. Um, I think that uh, Justin might have to leave, but I do want to allow a couple minutes for questions if anyone, on the, um, if anyone on the phone line has a question. So if anyone on the phone line has a question, feel free to ask. Uh, this is Lisa Goddard. I have a couple questions. Um, okay. uh, First, because I think this is probably the shortest one, um, for, for David Nealon. Are you there, David? Is David still on? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, there you are. Um, so I thought the, the Taylor diagram analysis was interesting, and I was wondering if you had done a similar thing um, looking at the 20th century so you could get a sense of where the observations fit into it, like, say, maybe the last 50 years of the 20th century or something. In, in terms of the precipitation pattern over the climatology over particular regions? 
Um, well, the, the the Taylor diagram, so like the pattern correlations and the, the magnitude of the um, standard deviations and things like that. Uh, yes. Um, the, uh, the um, well, so partially. Um, we, we were showing two different types of Taylor uh, diagrams. Um, uh, for instance, in the ENSO signal, uh, the, you had the, the correlation uh, ordinate being the spatial correlation with the observation. And, um, so that we also have for certain regions for the climatology, but I don't have them in hand. Um, you know, they tend to be fine, <laughs> uh, um, not as bad as some of the things that we saw for the global change, precipitation change, and where those were model-to-model um, -model comparisons. Um, so, so nothing in the simulation of present climatology is quite as bad as that intermodal agreement. Well, I, I actually was thinking in, in terms of trends, but I, I realize that the trends are weak for the last 50 years, but, you know, at least that, that would be observation, because you would expect a multi-model mean to have a much weaker variance than any of the ensemble members that went into it. Uh, yes, we have not done the trends um, uh, for the historical period. That's, uh, we can do that. I think that. that'd be interesting. <laughs> sure, um, yeah. Okay, the, so the other question I want to ask is, is, a, is a little broader. It's on the El Nino talks, and um, I would say it's mostly focused at, um, at uh, Jin Yu's presentation, but maybe there are some messages um, also for the, the last talk that was presented. And that is, um, I, I'm, and I guess this is, is related to just interactions that I have in dealing with the information on on ENSO in the climate change projections, I think that there's a, a lot of confusing information uh, related to El Nino uh, in the climate change projections and the, the way that that's presented in the literature. And part of that is because, uh, as a few studies have shown, there's very few models that actually do El Nino in, in even a quasi-realistic way. I mean, when you're looking at the coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere, the seasonality, or these things that really sort of did, um, are some of the defining characteristics of ENSO um, itself, rather than just the fact that you have some um, trop equatorial ocean basin. And what those studies have shown is that there's maybe four or five models in CMIP-3 that actually do a, a reasonable job with ENSO. And so if that's the case, then I think it becomes a little confusing um, to how to interpret the results when all of the models from CMIP-3 go into the analysis as opposed to the ones that, that do a credible El Nino. And so I was wondering if, um, if Jim, if you considered um, pairing your analysis down to um, that, that subgroup of models that actually has been uh, deemed as at least credible and then maybe applying a similar sort of filtering on CMIP-5 that's been done in these previous studies to, again, um, bring things down in, in terms of, like, actual ENSO dynamics. Um, I think this might go to the asymmetry issue as well, so that's why I sort of mentioned that one. But in doing that, um, it, it sort of filters out those models that are just getting ENSO noise, and, and so things that you know, teleconnections due to ENSO noise, and how do, how do I interpret that? Or if you get really large overlap in, in the magnitude of ENSO, because a lot of them just have these sort of noisy variability, I don't know how to interpret that. Um, so, so I was just wondering if you, if you considered that, Jin. Uh, yeah, actually that's a, a difficult question to answer. Yeah, that's true that uh, you, if you compare the whether model is similar to El Nino realistic, you can look at the pattern, look at the many different ways. Yeah. So in the talk I present, I just want to simplify by just looking at the intensity of each type of the ENSO. And even for that definition or identification of two types of ENSO, um, different also have different uh, methodology. Yeah. So, so here we actually did, uh, when we project the uh, future change to these two type of ENSO, we actually also focus on, we also compare 
fully multi-model mean intensity, we also look at only a small group of the about seven models. Now we believe that uh, produce a better simulation of the two type ENSO, and we only look at this uh, seven, seven or eight model, actually six model probably, see how the ENSO intensity change from pre-industrial to historical to the uh, uh, future warming. Yeah, that's the approach we we take right now, yeah. So, but I agree with you, if you look into more detail of the ENSO uh, property, then it become very complicated and difficult to really select which model is the best of uh, ENSO simulation. And yeah, and also to relate to the ENSO impact, for example, on the U.S. winter temperature, yes. We also try to just focus on just uh, the way we define the way we define the two type of ENSO and how each of them impact the U.S. temperature. And uh, people may look at that issue from a different angle, yeah. That's all I can say right now. <laughs> Yeah, so I, so I think it might be helpful if there, there's a paper by um, Gilliardi, um, I think 2006, and, and also one from Von Oldenborg et al. in maybe 2005. And both of those come up with a, a set of maybe five models from CMIP3. So it'd be, it'd be maybe instructive to see how that subgroup compares to the larger set that you're looking at, at least for that CMIP3 part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I also just wanted to mention in terms of, of papers, because um, it, it might be kind of new, uh, Ben Geis and his student um, Suliana Ray or Ray Suliana, I can't remember which order, um, have a paper fairly recently where they're looking at um, ENSO events and, and sort of challenging this this, this uh, notion of having two types of ENSO. And um, so maybe it's just something to consider. I know there are different camps of thought on this, but in their analysis, what they're suggesting is that um, the Eastern Pacific versus the Central Pacific are sort of two ends of the spectrum, and actually the, the more likely scenario is somewhere in between, if you look at the past observations. So just, um, so Ben Geis, um, I think he's the second author, but it, it, within the last year, mm -hmm. this paper came out, and it's a pretty interesting analysis. Yeah, we are aware of this uh, argument, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Lisa, thanks a lot for the questions. Uh, are there any other questions on the phone? Um, on the ENSO question, uh, just um, mentioned to Jinyi, it, it might be interesting to um, do something comparable to what we've been doing where um, you uh, look at the models that have multiple runs, because mm -hmm. uh, that can be a sizable error bar for certain things, and it's good to have that in perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's yeah, we, that, that's a good point. We did that also in um, Coyeo and Goddard 2009 to look at the ensemble members. There is a big spread. Great. Thanks for the comment, David. Uh, are there any other questions or comments on the line? Okay, well, if there's nothing else, um, we'll call it quits for today. We're working to put together uh, an additional webinar. This was originally supposed to be the last in this uh, last webinar in this year's MAP webinar series, but we're working to put together another webinar next month on the topic of decadal prediction. Um, the speakers and date are TBD, so um, I'll distribute uh, a notification about this through the usual mailing list, and uh, also keep your eyes on the MAP website. Um, the recording of this particular webinar should be up by the end of the week, and um, hopefully we'll be able to announce speakers in time for the decadal prediction webinar soon. So thanks to all of our speakers. This is a really excellent series of talks, um, very interesting analysis of CMIP5. And uh, thanks also to all of our attendees. So we'll talk to you next month. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.